Isaiah 41, verse number 6 says, they, they helped everyone his neighbor, and everyone said to his brother, Be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer, him that smote the anvil, saying, It is ready for the soldering. And he fastened it with nails, that it should not be moved. But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend, thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth, and called thee from the chief men thereof, and said unto thee, Thou art my servant. I have chosen thee, and not cast thee away. Fear thou not, for I am with thee. What's the next three words, church? Be not dismayed, dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee, yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Let's pray together. Father, add your blessing to the scripture here this evening and others that we'll turn to and look at tonight as we come to this uh, wonderful, wonderful admonition that we are to be not dismayed because you are God. And I pray, Lord, you'll bless our study of the scriptures this evening. That, Lord, you'll be, it will be a help and encouragement to each of us this evening, Lord, that you're our God and these precious promises that you give to us here in Isaiah 41, verse number 10. Holy Spirit, be our teacher and help us this evening as we study your word together. In Jesus' name we ask it. Amen. Amen. Isaiah, as you know, has been referred to as a, as a miniature Bible because Isaiah has 66 chapters in it, like 66 books of the Bible. Uh, There's a division in Isaiah, and it's between the 39th and the 40th chapter of Isaiah. How many Old Testament books are there? 39, and uh, 40 would start the New Testament. And it's interesting, in Isaiah 40, when you read Isaiah 40, beginning in verse 3, it says, The voice of him that crieth in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, and make straight... In the desert, a highway for our God. Who does that sound like? Sounds like John the Baptist, doesn't it? Coming on the scene. And uh, it's the beginning of what the New Testament is. And so the, the first 39 chapters would correspond to the Old Testament. And the, the, the last 27 corresponding, of course, to the New Testament uh, emphasis on grace and restoration. And uh, these, these chapters are written to the children of Israel, the people of Israel, who are... Uh, under great duress and distress they're afflicted and they're really filled with fear they're not sure what what's going to happen to them Uh, they are they have been under attack and they're kind of discouraged in fact they're dismayed and we'll talk about what that means here in just a minute and kind of very hurting and so the the Lord wants to give them some promises here that he's going to take care of them that they are his people, he is not going to cast them off forever. That he is going to be with them, and he's going to give them uh, some help. Uh, Even before they go into Babylon in captivity for 70 years, God's giving them assurance he's going to get them out. Okay? Now, most of them don't remember that. And uh, just like most of us forget God's promises uh, that he makes to us, and they don't remember that, but God is going to take care of him He's such a gracious God. So he's telling us not to be dismayed. Now dismay is an interesting word. To be dismayed means to destroy the courage or the resolution. And you destroy it by dread or apprehension. I I call it the what if syndrome. You ever know people like that? Something great, man, this is going to be great. Yeah, but what if this happens? Yeah, but what if that happens? And uh, boy, and it just drains the drains the courage and the, the enthusiasm right out of you because everybody's wondering, thinking the worst that could take place. It, it means when you're dismayed, it causes you to lose enthusiasm. It causes you to be disillusioned. It'll cause you to be upset. You know, several times this is used in the Bible and it's interesting to, to as I went back and read some scriptures, let's look at a few of them uh, just as a foundation to the study here this evening. Let's just start in the book of Joshua, all right? Joshua 1 and verse 9, most of you know what is taking place in the book of Joshua. In this particular chapter, Moses has died. And 
God took him and God buried him and wouldn't let uh, anybody know where he, where he was. It was a private funeral and uh, just God and Moses. And now Joshua is taking over. Uh, big shoes to fill. And, and you understand, one of the reasons, do you remember why Moses, why, what the reason was Moses couldn't go into the promised land? Anybody remember? Yeah, he got angry and smote the rock. But why was he angry? Yeah, the people. <laughs> he was fed up, man. And, uh, and, and because of that, he lost it. And now Joshua's taken over. And I wonder what he's thinking. Now, I, I, I wonder if Joshua ever thought, I don't know that I want this job. I'm not sure that I, 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 don't, I don't want to be a servant anymore. I don't want to be vice president ready to move into the office, you know. Uh, and, and so God has to encourage Joshua quite a bit in Joshua chapter 1. Uh, he, he several times tells him, uh, notice verse number 7, Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Then, then he go to verse number 9. Have not I commanded thee? Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou what? Dismayed. There's our word. For the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Joshua. Joshua was facing dismay. He was facing some disillusionment. He was facing uh, uh, kind of a loss of courage. How many times did God encourage him to be of good courage? Come on, Joshua. I'm with you. We're going to do this thing. I mean, he's really trying to give him the pep talk uh, to get, get things going. Look at Joshua chapter 8. You go further in. They've conquered Jericho, and they've moved on into the land now. And the Lord, uh, they're, they, they've had to deal with Ai and, the, and, and destroying Achan and the sin in the camp from Jericho. But the Lord said to Joshua, 8, chapter 8, verse 1, the Lord said to Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee, arise, go up to Ai. And now he gives them the battle plan to take Ai and uh, to defeat the king of Ai. What, what do you need? Hey, don't be dismayed. Don't lose your enthusiasm. Don't, don't get disillusioned. Uh, don't, don't lose your courage. Okay? Joshua, I'm with you. Here's the plan. You're going to conquer the land. Go to Joshua chapter 10. Joshua chapter 10. This time, Joshua is talking to the people. And he's, he's captured some kings and he's got them in a cave and he's calling some men to come out and, and, and kill the kings. And, and, he, and he tells them, verse 24, back, to back up, it came to pass when they brought out the kings unto Joshua, that Joshua called for all the men of Israel and said unto the captains of the men of war which went with him, Come near, put your feet upon the necks of these kings. And they came near and put their feet upon the necks of them. And Joshua said unto them, Fear not, nor be dismayed. Be strong and of a good courage. For thus shall the Lord do to all your enemies against whom ye shall fight. And afterwards Joshua smote them and slew them and hanged them on five trees. And they were hanging upon the trees until the evening. Again, over and over again, you read about them not being dismayed, but having courage. But being strong. But having faith and trust in God. And don't lose your enthusiasm for the things of God. Uh, if, if he had to tell Joshua not to get dismayed and had to remind his people not to get dismayed, do you think he might have to remind us not to get dismayed? I think it may be something that we'd wrestle with and that we would lose that courage a little bit and, and begin to get disillusioned somewhat. The other time this is mentioned, and, and another time I should say, is a familiar passage to most of us. That's 1 Samuel 17. Anybody want to tell me what's in 1 Samuel 17? Yeah, David and Goliath. That's right. David and Goliath. And, and it's mentioned here in 1 Samuel 17 when Goliath came out. Goliath in 17.10 said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. And when Saul, verse, 10, verse 11 of 1 Samuel 17, when Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed. And greatly afraid. You notice how often 
dismayed and fear are go together. <laughs> they, they, they're always coupled together. And any time you succumb to fear, discouragement follows. Any time you succumb to fear, discouragement will always follow. Okay? Whenever you, whenever you yield to faith, and you act in faith, victory will follow. <laughs> Courage will follow. Every single time. So, you find yourself sometimes getting disillusioned or feeling like you're losing your courage, feeling like the fear is overtaking you, then you have to remember what he told Israel in Isaiah 41.10, be not dismayed. Be not dismayed. Now, in Isaiah 41.10, go back to that if you would please, he's going to give them three promises to go by that we're going to look at this evening, alright? Isaiah 41 verse 10. Three promises. That's how you don't, this is how you won't get dismayed. This is how you attack your uh, discouragement. Attack being disillusioned. And to stay on top side, so to speak. And to continue to walk by faith and not by sight is by remembering these three promises. And the first promise is the promise of His presence. The promise of His presence. Fear thou not, He said, for I am with thee. You have the presence of God with us. And can I say three things about that? Number one, His presence is powerful. His presence is powerful. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. When Jesus sent the disciples out to preach the gospel, before He sent them out, He said, All power is given unto Me in heaven and earth. When He sent them out, hey, He sent them out... Uh, to preach the gospel, to cast out devils, to heal the sick, to raise the dead. Did you ever think about that? We were listening Sunday night and uh, Pastor Kingsbury was bringing this out and I thought it was such a great point. You know, you, you, you think about these 12 guys who Jesus chose. Maybe... Maybe five or six of them, half of them fishermen, tax collector, you know, some other odds and ends through there. None of them public speakers. And Jesus said, gathers them together and says, now here's what you're going to do. You're going to go out and you're going to preach. I wonder if they looked at the other and said, what are we going to do? And who's going to listen to us? You don't understand. You understand, they had, they had the, that's how the news was given in those days. You would have like the town crier. You would have some public speaker. He'd come into a gathering place or wherever there was a gathering of people. Hey, let me tell you what's going on. And he'd give the report. He'd give the news. Well, he says, I want you to, anytime you see somebody gather around, hey, I want to tell you about Jesus. The Messiah has come. Really? You better, you better have some power. You better make sure you have presence, the presence of God. It's a powerful presence. But wait a minute. He didn't just say you're going to preach. And by the way, if most of you, if I said here's what you're going to do tomorrow, you're going to go out, you're going to find any gathering you can, and you're going to stop them, and you're going to preach to them. Yeah, that's what most of you would do. <laughs> I'm like, what? But I said, no, not only that, when you find somebody sick, I want you to heal them. You think they looked at each other and said, Jesus, why don't you stick to doing that? We, we liked watching you do that. You think we're going to do that? But wait, it was beyond that. If you find anybody who's dead, bring them back to life. You ever think about that? You talk about fear. You talk about getting, getting somebody out of their comfort zone. I mean, all you said was follow you. You didn't say anything about all this stuff. But you had to have power. His presence is powerful. The presence of God is a powerful thing. And God gives us His presence. How do we have His presence? In the person of the Holy Spirit of God. The, the power that raised Jesus from the dead is the power of the Spirit. That power resides in you and me. 
That power is inside of each of us. You, we like to quote Ephesians 3.20 that unto him that is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. And boy, we like to quote that. But wait, the verse doesn't end there. According to the power that worketh where? In us. Where is God going to do that exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think? In us. See? By the power that's in us. So when God says, I have the promise of His presence, I have the promise of His power. Power over sin. Power over stubborn habits. Power over, uh, you know, uh, genetics. Hmm? Well, my family's always had tempers. Well, Jesus gives you power to overcome that. And to change that. Okay? So, His presence is powerful. Number two, His presence is personal. I like what he says, for I am with thee. I am is the power, with thee is the personal. Corey Ten Boom said, in times of fear, I don't wrestle, I nestle. Because he's personal. He's a personal God. We, we say it sometimes, if you trusted Christ as your personal Savior, Believing that Jesus is the Savior of the world, there's people in, who die and go to hell believing that. You have to believe Him as your personal Savior. That He died for your sins. He's a, it's a personal presence. It's, it's, a, it's a, a, an intimate fellowship with Him. It's, uh, you know, I've been thinking about something I read and I, I'm, I'm not I'm just going to throw it out there for you because I'm not sure about it yet but um, we hear a lot about people say it's the relationship with Jesus Christ you know do you know that's that term isn't found in the Bible look out huh? that's why I was careful to say it's a fellowship with him that's a Bible term that's a Bible word you understand? And, but it is personal. That's why, listen, and help me help you with something. When someone says, you want to witness to somebody, and they say, oh, that's private. No, it isn't. It's personal, but it's not private. Why is it in private? Because Jesus commanded us to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. That's not private. But it is personal. And there's a difference. And so it's a personal thing. Its presence is very personal with each one of us. God, God isn't just God doesn't just save you and then He's off there in the universe somewhere. Somewhere. No, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. See, He's is He your shepherd? Is He is He the Savior? Is He my Savior? Is it personal with you? You see. His presence is personal. His presence is powerful. Number three, or C there, His presence is perpetual. I like what He said in Matthew 28. When He said, Lo, I am with you, He said, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Jesus, it's, it's perpetual. How do you, when, when Jesus says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. How can you possibly believe you can be saved and then be lost? At what point did Jesus leave you? When he promised, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Say, here's the, here's the issue that, that people like to say. Um, let's see. I'm trying to look for somebody intelligent up here and I'm not finding anybody. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Nathan Moreland, you look intelligent. Come up here. Come up here quick. Jump up here. Okay? All right. Now, Nathan's going to be the Christian. Okay? And I'm going to be Jesus. Okay? Now, he invites me to be his Savior. I, by, fa by faith, I come to dwell with him. You know what I tell you? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So, you going to go somewhere? No. Yes, you are. Go somewhere. Go. I'm going with him. Wherever he goes. So I mean, I'm, I'm, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Well, yeah, but you know, well, yeah, but you'll leave him. Go ahead, try to leave me. <laughs> All 
Aren't you going to leave me? I thought you were leaving me. Go ahead. Get rid of me. <laughs> Get rid of me. Go ahead. Yeah. He can't. You know why? I'll never leave you nor forsake you. So you can. It's, it's perpetual. Thank you, Nathan. Appreciate your help. Aren't you glad it is? He's with us all the way. All the way to glory. Amen. Number two, the second promise. The first promise was the promise of his presence. The second promise is the promise of his person. Notice what he said. Be not dismayed. I am thy God. I am thy God. There is a fellowship. I am thy God. It's personal. It's a personal thing between you and God. I need to know that He's my God. I need to know that He's my Heavenly Father. There, you know, how many of you have more than one child in your family? Hmm? Let me see your hand. Okay. Do you have the same relationship? Do you have the same kind of relationship with every child? Is it everybody the same? No. In fact, each relationship is different. Bob, you have four children. Okay? And your relationship with each one of the, your children is different. You're, you're the same dad to each of them. But your, their, their, their fellowship with you and the way you interact with each of them is different. And you know, God is the same way. That's why, that's why you know, there are times when you're in your Christian life, you'll hear things about your personal time with God. Okay? Okay? And some people will talk about things they do in their personal time with God. Well, I, I get a song book and I sing songs. Or I get the psalms and I pray the psalms to God. Or I, you, you hear all kinds of things. You ever, you ever hear little things like that that people do and you think, man, that sounds good. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try that. You ever, you ever try that? You ever, anybody ever been guilty of that and say, yeah, I'm going to go try that? Well, you know, and then and you're like, boy, that didn't do anything for me. You know why? That's, that's their fellowship with God. That's their relationship with God. But it's not you. Do you understand? You have to have your own personal fellowship with God. Your own, it's a personal thing with, his, with the person of God. He's your God. He is your Heavenly Father. And He wants to be a Father to you. So there are things that He alone can do, must do, and will do for me. All right. Number two, or be there, there's a realization of his person. A realization means I know that he is God. And if he's God, he can do anything. I love the verse, I think it's Job 42, and I think it's verse 2. Job simply says, I know that thou canst do everything. It's everything or anything. I know that thou canst do everything. Isn't that a great realization when you come to that fact? God can do anything. Isn't it amazing how often we tell God what we're up against? Or what He's up against? Or what the deadline is? I think of that every time I think of Mary and Martha. Lord, man, it's too late now. He's dead. Imagine telling Jesus it's too late. Jesus says it's too late for what? I just bring him back from the dead. It's no big deal. You see, we, he, he, a realization that he's God. You ever come to the realization that you serve God? The, the, the God you read about in the Bible, that's our God. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. The arm of the Lord is not shortened that it cannot save. He's, he's still the same. The, the, the problem isn't that, well, why don't we see the miracles that some of the things God did in the Bible? The problem's not on God's end. The problem is on our end. He's still the same. A realization he's God. When Thomas missed church that Sunday night, when he stayed home to watch the Jerusalem Jaguars play football or something, and didn't go to church that Sunday night, who showed up at church that Sunday night? Hey, wasn't it something too? Jesus came to church on Sunday night. Wow. A lot of people would miss him then, huh? 
Talk about calling the FBI. You're calling the FBI to find out where the people are who come Sunday morning but never come back Sunday night. Amen. Maybe you look for the people who come Sunday and never come Wednesday. I don't know. But here they are. He wasn't there. And guess what? They come to tell Thomas, you won't believe it. I won't believe what? Guess who came to church tonight? Jesus. You know what he said? I don't believe it. And forever, he's known as Doubting Thomas. Probably a bad rap. When he did see Jesus, and Jesus didn't rebuke him, he just said, hey, reach your hand in my, in my side. Fill my wounds. And when he did, what did Thomas say? My Lord and my God. He realized Jesus is God. He's my God. I came to the realization, you're God. He should have had that already, but he didn't. It just finally the light bulb went on for him. He's God. There's a realization. There's, a, there's the fellowship. There's the realization. Then there's a rest. A rest. Be not dismayed. Be not dismayed. Now listen. If God is my God, and he's God and nothing is impossible for him and nothing's too hard for him and he can do anything and he can do everything, what do I have to fret about? What do I have to be afraid of? Why would I be disillusioned about anything? We're on the winning side. You see, he is our God. The songwriter wrote, There is a place of quiet rest near to the heart of God. A place where sin cannot molest near to the heart of God. O oh, Jesus, blessed Redeemer, sent from the heart of God, hold us who wait before Thee near to the heart of God. The next verse says, There's a place of comfort sweet near to the heart of God. A place where we, our Savior, meet near to the heart of God. Then it says there's a place of full release near to the heart of God. A place where all is joy and peace near to the heart of God. Have you found that place of rest? You could cancel your psychiatrist if you found that place of rest. You could get off your anxiety medicine if you found that place of rest. Boy, that's quiet. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He gives his beloved rest, sleep. So there's a rest. Don't have to be dismayed. I rest in him. Why? He can do anything. He can do everything. Why am I being dismayed? See, I have his promise. So do you. So we see we have the, the promise of his presence, the promise of his person, and thirdly, the third promise is we have the promise of his power. Notice what he said. I will strengthen thee. Yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. Yea, in the Bible, simply means surely. So when he says, I will strengthen thee, surely I will help thee, surely I will uphold thee with the right hand of my power. That's what he's talking about. So we find out three things he'll do. Number one, he'll strengthen us. He'll strengthen us. The New Testament parallel would be 2 Corinthians 12 where Paul sought the Lord to take the thorn in the flesh away from him. And the Lord said, no, you need that because then you're going to rely on my strength. He said, Paul, my grace will be sufficient for you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Somebody says, I just feel so weak. Good. That's where God wants you to be. Because then you rely on His strength. Anytime you think, I got this, I can do this, you're headed for a colossal fail. 
Because you're relying on your strength and not His. Let Him strengthen you. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Okay? Rely on His strength, not your own. See, the, the law is all about you doing the work. Man doing everything. Grace is allowing God to do the work. In us and through us. Grace is, is I know we have all kinds of little you know, acrostics and sayings, you know, God, God's riches at Christ's expense and all those things, and that's, that's okay. I think grace is, is God's sufficiency or God's power in my life enabling me to do what He wants me to do. So I do it not in my strength, but His strength. Realizing that the arm of flesh will fail me, I dare not trust my own. Okay? He'll strengthen us. Then it says He'll support us. He says, I'm going I'm to help you. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to help you. It means He'll give us what we need when we need it in the exact proportion that we require it. God will always supply what we need when we need it at the exact time we need it. And the amount what we need. God always knows what we need. He said, I will not leave you comfortless. John 14, 18. I'm going to give you the comforter. I'm going to give you the paraclete, the one who's called alongside to help you. The one, the one who lives inside of us, the person of God, is God the Holy Spirit. He's the one who, that's why the Bible says, be filled with the Spirit. Let the Spirit fill you. Let Him take over you. Then you'll do it in His power, not your power. And He will give us the support we need. You see, here's the thing. So many people neglect the Holy Spirit of God. And, and let me help you with something. The Holy Spirit is going to help us. How will the Holy Spirit help us? Well, the Holy Spirit wrote a book. Holy men of old spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. So when I need help, when He says, I'll help you, I need support, where will I get that support? I'll get the support from God's Word. When David came back and to his hometown, Ziklag, and he found that they had burned it with fire and taken all the wives and children captive, and his own men, his own loyal, faithful men, talked about stoning David and killing him, the Bible says David encouraged himself in the Lord. You know why people feel like they need support groups? Because they're not, they've not learned to support themselves with God's Word. Listen, listen. Brother Currington came up with the Daily Journal. It's, the, it's a book that breaks down a personal time with God. How to build a personal walk with God. How to have a, 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 a nice fellowship with God, a relationship with God back and forth. And grow in your dependence on God. And why did he do that? Because Brother Currington said every Monday morning he'd be out on the weekend or he'd be out on the weekend helping start a chapter on Friday night in a church and, and maybe come back in Saturday on a Sunday. Monday, go out to, the, to his office at the RU home and you know what he said? Every Monday morning there'd be a line of guys lined up. I got to talk to Brother Steve. I got to talk to Brother Steve. I got to talk to Brother Steve. You know what he said? These people are relying on me. And they need to rely on God. They need to have a relationship with Him. They need to be able to go to Him for their, for their help. Not Brother Currington. And he developed the Daily Journal. You understand? That's what everybody should do. 
Not that, not that you don't need counsel ever. Not that you don't ever go to somebody to get some godly advice. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying so many times people are so quick. Oh, I've got to tell this person. Oh, I've got to talk to this person. Oh, I need somebody to talk to. I need somebody. You, you have somebody. And you have His Word right there. Let the Spirit of God help you. And He'll do it with the Word of God. Boy, that's quiet. He'll strengthen us. He'll support us. Number three, or C, He'll sustain us. Notice He said, I'll not only help you, I'll not only uphold you, I'll, up, I'll not only, I'm sorry, strengthen you and help you, I'll uphold you with the right hand of my righteousness. He will sustain us. The right hand of His righteousness. God, God is going to uphold us with His right hand. In fact, it even talks in the Psalms that when you fall down, underneath are the everlasting arms. He's always there to pick us back up. He holds us. We're, we are, he, he, he is going to take us safe all the way to heaven. Okay? A, a lifeguard, if you're a lifeguard, and someone out there in the water is going under, and you see them flailing and screaming, and you jump in the water and you head out there to get them, and you grab hold of them and say, all right, I'm going to save you. And you, you grab them and Brother Moreland and you get them halfway in and then you say, okay, you're good. And you swim on into shore. Did you save them? No. You get them three quarters to shore and say, I think you'll make it on your own now. Don't worry about that water in your lungs. No big deal. No, you're not the Savior. You're only, you're only the Savior. You've only saved them if you get them safely on shore to where they're out of any danger. And I submit to you, He's not the Savior if He doesn't get us safely all the way to shore. And He will get you and I safely to shore. Amen? He will sustain us. God who saves you will sustain you. He'll give you what you need. Why? His right hand. That is the hand of power with God. Notice verse number 9. Thou, thou whom I have taken from the ends of the earth and called thee from the chief men thereof and said unto thee, Thou art my servant, I have chosen thee and not cast thee away. Look at verse 17. When the poor and needy seek water and there is none and their tongue faileth for thirst, I the Lord will hear them I, the God of Israel, will not forsake them. He sustains us. God didn't save you to abandon you. God didn't save you to put you on your own the rest of the way. God saved us and He sustains us. 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. Will you look there with me quick and we'll be finished up. 1 Peter 1 verse 5. Are you okay? 1 Peter 1, verse 5. In fact, start with verse 3, okay? 1 Peter 1, verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. What keeps you? What sustains you? What sustains me? The power of God. The power of God. We're upheld by His mighty, omnipotent hand. How firm a foundation. You know, Whenever I think of Isaiah 41 and verse 10 about be not dismayed, <clears throat> I always think of that song. Be not dismayed, whatever be tied, God will take care of you. We sing it here oftentimes. That was written in 1904. And it was composed while a couple, a preacher and his wife called the Martins, 
We're spending several weeks as guests at the Practical Bible Training School in Leicestershire, New York. And Mr. Martin, visiting there, was helping the president of the school, John Davis, prepare a songbook. The Reverend W. Stillman Martin was a well-known Baptist evangelist, and he was preaching at a church some distance from the Bible school. But that Sunday morning, his wife, Mrs. Martin, became suddenly ill, making it impossible for her to accompany her husband to his speaking engagement. Mr. Martin considered canceling his speaking assignment since it would be needful for him to be gone from her for a considerable time. But it was that time his young son spoke up and said, Father, don't you think if God wants you to preach today, he'll take care of mother while you're gone? Walter Martin preached that Sunday and then returned home later that evening to find his wife much improved. In fact, while he was gone, she prepared a new text that was inspired by her son's statement just before her husband left that morning. And before retiring to bed that evening, Walter Martin wrote the music to his wife's text. Mrs. Martin describes the composition. She said, quote, God will take care of you was written on a Sunday afternoon while my husband went to a preaching appointment. When he returned, I gave the words to him and he immediately sat down to his little billhorn organ and wrote the music. That evening, he and two of the teachers sang the complete song. It was then printed in the songbook he was compiling for the school. God will take care of you. Um, when you sing the song, I think it's 180 in your hymn book. When you sing the song, if you sing all four stanzas and the chorus in between, you'll sing the title 20 times. God will take care of you. I think it's fitting that we sing that to end our service tonight. Okay, so turn to 180 and let's sing... Be not dismayed, whate'er be tied, God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide, God will take care of you. Think about the words as you sing this. And remind yourself of Isaiah 41, verse 10. Brother Bob, you want to come? And we'll let you lead us in this. 180. Let's stand together and we'll sing it. Brother Bob will lead us. Then we'll have prayer and we'll go home tonight, all right? In fact, I'll pray, then we'll sing. Let's do that, all right? Father, thank you for this evening. Thank you for an opportunity for us to study your word together. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful promise here of be not dismayed, for I am with thee, that you are our God. Thank you for these wonderful promises. Lord, may we draw near to you, and may we learn to cast all our care upon you, for you care for us. Lord, dismiss us now with your care. And Lord, as we sing this song tonight, may we sing it, may we listen carefully to the words. May it remind us of the precious promises of Scripture that God will take care of us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, Brother Bob. Be not dismayed, whatever be tide. God will take care of you. Beneath his wings of love abide. God will take care of you. God will take care of you. Through every day or all the way. He will take care of you. of toil when heart doth fail God will take care of you when dangers fierce your paths assail God will take care of you God